be a great version. And also, um, the podcasts are online. Please go check those out. Um, as a publisher of the Montreal Review of Books, and on a more personal note, as a white settler with roots in the Netherlands and Ireland, um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're gathered in a place known as Jojage in the Ganyahanga language and Muniang in the language of the Anishinaabe. Our association represents a diverse uh, community who live and work on the territories of many indigenous peoples, um, including the Ganyahaga, Abenaki, Anishinaabe, and Huron-Wendat. And as a publication celebrating books, we acknowledge the first storytellers of these lands. Um, we have a really, once again, uh, lovely addition for you this evening. But before we get to that, um, I have a few people to thank. Uh, firstly, our, our wonderful team, uh, most of whom are here tonight, uh, who worked really hard on putting this issue together. Our editor, Malcolm Fraser, our uh, associate editor, Nive Damaraj, our new associate publisher, Alexandra Swenny, our uh, fabulous graphic designer, David LeBlanc, who's been us with basically since day one, our national ad sales manager, Michael Weil, who may or may not be tuning online from Toronto. Hello, Michael. Um, all of our reviewers and illustrators um, and our live stream collaborators, collaborators from the Community Digital Arts Hub. Um, of course, I'd also like to express gratitude to uh, our funders with whom the MRB would not exist. Um, the Government of Canada's Canada Book Fund, the Canada Council for the Arts, SODEC, and the Conseil des Arts de Montréal, who we met here at this very event last year. Um, we have a really fabulous uh, event for you lined up this evening with readings by three writers featured in the issue. Louisa Blair, who will also be giving a, a visual presentation to accompany her reading, uh, poet Jay Ritchie and Unya Kampadu. Um, thank you to Peter from Paragraph and everyone at Paragraph for uh, providing the books for sale this evening. Please pick up a copy if you haven't already. And the authors will be around for signings after the readings. Um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our editor, Malcolm Fraser. Uh, hi everyone. Sorry, we got our. I, 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 according to the schedule I looked at, Rachel was speaking before me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. Well, uh, thank you all so much for coming out. Um, well, we have a really exciting uh, trio of readers here tonight. Our new issue is out. I'm very happy with how it's turned out. We have a great cover by Kesna Dals. I don't know if Kesna's here tonight. There was some. She was invited anyway. Maybe she'll be here at some point. Um, well, I think Rachel was going to say a few words about the partnership with uh, Blue Met. Is that, uh, is that happening? No, it's not happening. Okay. Note to self. Check, <laughs> double check <laughs> schedule for events going forward. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, Rachel said many nice words earlier, so. Um, Thank you all for coming. It's nice to be here. Uh, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our first reader, uh, Louisa Blair. Uh, her, her book, The Calf with Two Heads, is out from local publisher and ALAC member Baraka Books. It's available for purchase uh, over at the Paragraph Books table here. Uh, Louisa is a writer, editor, and translator. She was born in Quebec City, raised in the UK, and returned to live in Quebec 25 years ago. Her books in English include The Anglos, The Hidden Face of Quebec City. Not, I'm, I'm a former Quebec City Anglo myself, not very many of us. Um, and uh, Iron Bars and Bookshelves, A History of the Morin Centre. She's also translated numerous books and exhibitions about history, culture and politics in Quebec. Her translation of Robert Lepage's play 887 was nominated for a Governor General's Prize back in 2019 and her exhibition on natural history in Quebec entitled Blossoms, Beetles, and Birds is on display at the Literary and History Society of Quebec. And we're very honored to have her here as a guest. Um, please welcome Louisa Blair. Hello, everybody. I am very honored to be here. 
at the um, spring launch of the spring issue of the Spring Montreal Review of Books. And as to be associated in any remote way with the um, Blue Metropolis International Literary Festival, it's also a huge, huge honor. So um, I'm very happy to be here and I welcome all of you and thank you for coming. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the book that I published in the fall, The Calf with Two Heads. Um, I myself am a very rare species, um, an Anglophone from Quebec City. And um, as you can tell from my accent, I presume. Yeah. So, no, I, I moved from Quebec at, as a child of four years old to England, and I grew up in England, then came back to Canada as an adult. And so I was displaced across the Atlantic twice. Not really displaced, I guess, just placed. And um, a bit like an invasive plant. And so I, I had to put down roots in, in different soils. And I'm also an amateur naturalist. So I'm going to start by actually reading a bit of the introduction, which is, which is why the kind of background to this book, why I wrote it. Oh, and I have some slides for you. Just to make it more interesting, you can look at them instead of me. There you go. Oh, that's a new one. There we go. So I did not grow up in a, in a family of scientists, but we learned about the flowers and the trees, the birds and animals that we saw. We took guidebooks with us on trips and consulted them when we came home from walks. We were lazier about identifying insects and shells and rocks, but we still looked at them closely, marveling over their different colors and shapes and textures. For me, natural history and art have always been closely intertwined. As my mother is an artist, close observation of this kind was part of our upbringing. And like many of the people in this book, we collect stuff. Our house is full of wildflowers, rocks, feathers, shells, and driftwood. These are all pictures by my mum, who's 93 years old. Although born in Canada, I grew up in rural Britain and spent a lot of my youth either up trees or among them, wandering for hours along streams and through woodlands and fields by myself or with my sister. We knew our patch of the earth better than we knew our own thoughts. I didn't think I could ever love anywhere as much, anywhere that didn't have the huge spreading English oaks or the beaches so old and wide that two people couldn't begin to wring them with their arms, anywhere without hedgehogs whiffling in the brambles or blue tits flying down to drink from the milk bottles left by our door that unique quality of light on misty English mornings, the smell of damp moss in a deep, twisting lane. But when I crossed back over the Atlantic to Quebec, I came to love our maples that turn in the fall, our sharp-leaved red oaks and the majestic white pines just as much. Some of the trees and birds and flowers were the same, and some were slightly different and some were completely unfamiliar. I learned their names all over again. Devil's paintbrush, chickadees, snowy owl, they were all new to me. This experience of translated, transatlantic, translated, rerouting led me to inquire about others who had traveled from England or France to the Canadas, upper and lower Canada, now Ontario and Quebec, 200 and more years before me, with a similar interest in observing, discovering, and collecting the natural world. First, I discovered that most of these naturalists were passionate amateurs like me. They, too, took great pleasure in exploring and naming and collecting. The word scientist was only coined in 1833. Second, I discovered that this transatlantic rerouting resulted in a whole new knowledge of natural history and not just due to the differences in species. It was a knowledge co-constructed between Europeans and indigenous people from the two sides of the Atlantic. The settlers who then made Canada their home, such as my ancestors, 
constituted a third party who began to negotiate this co-construction with indigenous people on the one hand, with their knowledge about nutrition, pharmacology, and topography, for example, and their colonial counterparts on the other, knowledge about taxonomies, theories, and instruments. With their different ways of relating to nature and the shifting power dynamics, this complex triangular web of relationships brought about new understandings of the world. This is a, a, a map made on an antelope skin by an artist, indigenous artist from um, Wyoming. And this is a, another map made by a man called Logan who marched across Canada trying to figure out what the rocks were underneath the soil. Our understandings have been similarly influenced by the shifting relations between professionals, trained geologists, for example, and amateurs, including members of local natural history societies, recreational gardeners, and walkers like myself. Natural history activities moved from field observations, drawing, collecting, museums, and classifying activities into academic, controlled, laboratory-based teaching and research. The emphasis is now swinging back to field research, to citizen scientists or amateurs who throughout the world are providing an unprecedented quantity of observation-based data, and to an acknowledgement that indigenous ways of knowing the earth are essential to our way forward. I think I'll stop, stop that bit right there. And what I want to do is just other than read you the entire book, I thought I would just show you a few pictures. And then you can read. later became known as science. And then, um, and this, this is um, in, at Université Laval, it became a kind of dumping ground for all these old natural, natural history museums. So there's tons in the basement of Université Laval, it's not open to the public, um, but I somehow managed to sneak in. There are just tons and tons of um, these remainders, leftovers of natural history museums, and including um, a cow with two heads. I didn't, I didn't put her in there, but um, she is there. And then finally, um, I, I, I want to read, I mean, finally in this bit, I want to read you um, a poem that my niece, Hannah, found for me after I'd already chosen the name of the book. It's called The Two-Headed Calf. Tomorrow, when the farm boys find this freak of nature, they will wrap his body in newspaper and carry him to the museum. But tonight he is alive and in the north field with his mother. It is a perfect summer evening. The moon rising over the orchard, the wind in the grass. And as he stares into the sky, there are twice as many stars as usual. That's by Laura Gilpin. So, um, yeah, this, my, my book is kind of a, a series of vignettes as Alexander mentioned in his 
um, review of it in the latest issue of the Montreal Review of Books. Um, and part of it talks about um, the art, natural history art, which, which is just a, a fantastic subject because the world is full of incredibly beautiful natural history art. Um, and um, these are some of, some of the very, very early natural history art. At the, at the beginning, a lot of art was done um, because they wanted to illustrate herbals. Herbals were like a, a book of medicine, and medicines at that time were plants and animals. And so this, this one on the left is a, is a 16th century Mexican herbal um, by an Aztec botanist. Um, and the other one is a, is a 17th century picture by a lithograph by a German whose name I can't remember because I can't see the notes on the bottom of my slides. Um, so the natural history, na natural historians, I mean, they needed, they needed artists to go with them on voyages. And so they, um, they, took, they took artists with them. And this, 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 these are a couple of pictures by a guy called Sidney um, Sidney Parkinson, who went on the Endeavour with James Cook, and he did 1,350 drawings. And you couldn't, remember, you couldn't take any photographs, and you couldn't really keep everything that you found, because it would rot, or it would just be eaten up by maggots. So you had to have somebody who was going to draw it, and draw it quickly, before it was eaten up by maggots. So this guy, Sidney Parkinson, sat in the Endeavour in a tiny little cabin, a boat, probably horrible weather, and he drew 1,350 drawings of what they, were, what they were finding. In fact, he died just after drawing that fantastic picture of the cockatoo. Um, so he never saw them published. And then, um, then the, the people did that for different reasons. Sidney Parkinson was, um, was, was, was a, a businessman. So was um, Elizabeth Black Blackwell. Well, she drew, she drew these drawings for her, um, her own herbal uh, because she needed to post bail for her husband, who was in jail. That was in 1739. And then this, these are pictures by Elizabeth Gould, who, who met her husband in an um, aviary and fell in love, of course. And they went to Australia together, and he wrote, he wrote books about the birds in Australia. And she illustrated them. She also illustrated for Darwin. Um, her husband forgot to put her name in the book. He named one rather unremarkable bird after her, but that's, that's it, that's how she's remembered, but she's left an incredible legacy, a beautiful art. And when it comes to Canada, this is, this is um, Lady Dalhousie, otherwise known as Christian Brown. She was the wife of the Governor General in, in Quebec in 1824, who arrived in Quebec in 1824, and she didn't draw so much herself, but she was a, a, a botanist. Um, and she, both of these, those things are named after. You can see the, the bird there, and then the drawing, which that is the drawing that is in her, is on the table there, the very drawing. Um, she went exploring and botanizing with her friends in Quebec in the early 19th century, and, and, and sent specimens to Kew Gardens, and they, like, lots of, you know, what, what the, great, the great prize was getting a plant named after you, and there were quite a few named after her and her, and her friends. Um, and, um, and then, but for a lot of people, it was sort of, um, it was, it, for upper class women, it was, a, it was a, a thing that you needed to do. You had to be able to draw and draw plants, and it was, it was a very popular kind of activity. And this was another, another um, rather upper class woman in Quebec City who drew these beautiful pictures, made a, a book of it for her son, uh, forgot to put her name on the book. Um, I didn't mention her name either, which is really unforgivable. Um, <laughs> Fanny, Am Fanny Amelia Bayfield. And then um, this is Agnes Fitzgibbon. Now, she was um, the daughter of Susanna Moody. You've all heard of Susanna Moody. Um, and she learned, she wanted to illustrate her aunt, Catherine Partrail's book. So she learned how to make lithographs, borrowed a lithograph, lithography stone, lithography stone, learned how to make li lithographs, colored them all herself and published the book. And she needed to do that too, to, um, because she had eight children and she was a widow. So this, this is, a, again, another book full of absolute treasures. Um, 
And for women in, in, in North America, it was kind of different than it was in England. They had a little bit more freedom. Um, it was a small community, so um, crossing cultures was kind of necessary if you weren't just going to be you know, with about three other people, um, in, in the Anglophone community anyway. And, um, but they were still pretty upper class, and they would go out on these botanizing expeditions, unchaperoned. So I talk quite a lot about geology, because geology was very, very exciting kind of discovery in um, this time. Um, the end of the 18th century, people started to re realize that fossils were the remains of living creatures. So then they thought, okay, and, that they f and they found that there were different kinds of creatures and different layers of the strata. So then they started to say, okay, so some of these creatures don't seem to exist anymore. So, hmm. The Bible, so that the story of the creation in the Bible, they, they didn't mention some of these, and also the story of Noah, like when he was collecting up animals to go into the, into the ark, he seemed to have forgotten a few. What happened to those animals? And that brought into question, of course, the whole, the whole um, idea that got, the, the world was made in six days, and um, a lot of natural historians actually um, very quickly, and theologians too accepted that, that maybe, you know, maybe it wasn't made in, it's in six days, and maybe in six eras or something, and they gradually kind of, so, so um, the whole, then, then, you know, the evolution, the whole story of evolution in, with, with, with Darwin and with um, Russell um, in Canada, how it, how it was received was not terribly well. Um, like Dawson, for example, who was the principal of McGill, he, um, he was okay about evolution as, as far as it went, but then when it came to saying that us human beings were related to apes, he said, no, 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 I, that's as far as I can go. So, um, and also the other big scientist in that era was Léon Provencher in, in Quebec, and he too um, lectured uh, for several years on what a load of rubbish evolution was. So it took, it took them a while to, to um, come to terms with it. Uh, that, that's, uh, um, that's by Dawson there. Dawson College, you know Dawson College, that's him. He did that lovely picture, so he, he was trying to understand. He was a, he was a really great geologist. And um, yeah, so uh, that's, there's a bit of that. How am I doing? Yeah, okay. Um, and then... So, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of just finish off by um, one of the fun things about writing this book was that the, the people who, who went out across Canada to explore it, um, you know, remember that, you know, it was all just such a mystery. Like, they, they didn't know about the Ice Age. They, like, why would I find a fossil of a shell at the top of a mountain? Why? You know, it was, it was, it was big questions. And, um, and they had incredible adventures. Like, the guy who did that geology map that I showed you, you know, he just basically did it by trudging across, uh, across the country on foot or in canoes. And so the adventure stories that are associated with these explorations and these discoveries and, and, and you know, new perspective on natural history, uh, there's just so many good stories that I couldn't resist them. Um, and a lot of people went by, by ship. Um, and, you know, going by ship across the north of Canada is a perilous thing. Um, there, was Dar there was Darwin, of course. Did I not show you the Darwin picture? Yeah, there we go. That's, that's Darwin's um, ship, and that's his explanation of evolution there. It's so simple, you see? <laughs> In his notebook. And, um, yeah, these guys had... Then this tragic story of Franklin, who lost his entire crew, and nobody found where the boat sank until 2014, where they found a wreck discovered in a strait called... Umiak Talik, which means there is a boat there. <laughs> In nearly 200 years, no one had thought to ask. The Inuit knew where it was all along. Um, and then, um, then there was the Canadian Arctic expedition, which um, I devote a little bit of time to, 1913 to 1918, which nobody remembers because it happened during the war and it just got completely, First World War, it got kind of ignored. Um, and the great adventure story with the Canadian Arctic Exhibition is what I'm just going to read you now as a final bit of the book. Um, the Carluck. So it was, it was a scientific expedition. Um, that's not actually the Carluck. I cheated. Why am I telling you that? You wouldn't have known. Um, 
and um, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was they made they they explored their ambition was to explore a million square miles, quite ambitious. On the crew, they had a drug drug addict, an alcoholic, and someone with venereal disease, um, and. <laughs> Um, and the, the leader of the expedition just abandoned them. So here's, here's when the, the ship got stuck in the ice. Um, where am I going to start? Okay. Yeah. The expedition's flagship, an ex-whaler called the Carluck, left Victoria, BC in 1913. Its captain, Robert Bartlett, was from Newfoundland and believed in placing science before exploration. He was an expert ice captain and had sailed for the Arctic explorer Robert Peary. Along the way, the Karluk picked up four Inupiat hunters. One hunter, Kuraluk, brought along his wife, Kiruk, their two daughters, and a cat. They also had a team of 16 dogs. Two other ships were to meet them up in the Yukon. The Karluk never made it. It got stuck in the ice. Instead of waiting around, Stephenson left to go caribou hunting. He was the leader of the expedition. And when he returned, the ship had drifted off. He gave up looking for it and departed to carry on with the exhibition, e expedition elsewhere, leaving Bartlett and the rest of the crew to their fate. Kuruluk and another hunter, Katuk Tovik, kept the expedition supplied with fresh seal and walrus meat, but after drifting with the moving ice for four months, the ship was nipped in the ice and crushed to pieces. Bartlett had already moved food, dog teams, and ammunition into a house built on the ice and asked Kiruk to make them new boots and repair their clothes. Bartlett stayed on board until the last moment playing Chopin's funeral march loudly on the ship's phonograph. The Carlock sank within minutes of Bartlett stepping off, her yard arms snapping as she disappeared through a hole in the ice. She creaked and groaned and once or twice actually sobbed as the water oozed through her seams, he recalled. There's nothing more human than a ship in ice pressure. Those who left, were left behind fought bitterly as they waited. Two died, one was shot, possibly murdered. The misery and desperation of our situation multiplied every weakness, every quirk of personality, every flaw in character, a thousandfold, reported an expedition member we can understand. Um, and eventually they walked to, some of them walked to Siberia and they managed to rescue the rest of the people in September 1914, including the cat. And including the daughter of the couple who they had brought, um, Ruth, her name is, who, who lived to a grand old age of, of, of 97. Ruth McPee Ipaluk. And I'm just going to, to finish, I'm going to read you a couple of um, bits that I found of what it was like to be left behind on the ice there um, from the point of view of one of the, one of the um, ex expedition members and then a, a song that was sung by an Inuit girl to the crew. Billy was there ahead of us. They had no luck hunting. We started digging for some muskox and carcass left here last fall. We dug all night and finally had the luck to strike one towards morning under an eight-foot snowbank. The wolves had eaten one side, but there was still enough left for a feed for us and the dogs. It was very rotten, but we did not wait. We went down on our hands and knees and dug in with our knives to fill our stomachs. That was Carsten Anderson's diary. Melville Island, and this is a song that was sung by Kaniuk, a Puvlik girl at Prince Albert Sound. My thoughts went constantly to the great land. My thoughts went constantly. The game, bull caribou those, thinking of them, I thought constantly. My thoughts went constantly. To the big ice, my thoughts went constantly. The game, bull caribou there. Thinking of them, my thoughts went constantly. My thoughts went constantly. To the dance house, my thoughts went constantly. The dance songs and the drums. Thinking of them, my thought went constantly. I was beginning to waste away exceedingly from hunger. 
So just an idea of how different life was from us sitting here scrolling on our phones all day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Louisa, uh, for that reading and, and for your book. Um, as soon as this came across our desk, we knew uh, it was too interesting uh, not uh, to write about. Um, Louisa will be up later to answer uh, your questions along with our other readers. I'll move right along to our next reader. Uh, Jay Ritchie is here. Jay, uh, come on up. Um, Jay is a writer, editor, teacher, and McGill English PhD student. He's the author of the poetry collection Cheer Up Jay Ritchie, available here from Coach House Books, a collection of short stories and a poetry chapbook. He has an MFA in poetry from UMass Amherst, and he was the assistant editor for Metatron Press and managing editor of Valum Magazine. Uh, his latest is listening in many publics from Invisible Publishing, uh, which is not available here, but you can pre-order it if you have the technology to scan the QR code over there, uh, I recommend it. Uh, Jay will be uh, reading from listening in many publics. Uh, come on up, Jay, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here. There's so many people to thank. Um, MRB, the whole team. Ned, Ronnie for engaging with the ideas of the book so thoroughly in the in the review in the latest issue, Desida for streaming this, for recording this, Blue Mat, Hotel Dies, the list goes on. Um, yeah, so I have a this book that I'm going to read from hasn't been uh, printed yet, but it's happening very very soon. Um, the poems in this book started to come together when I began composing music with a synthesizer and with a loop machine. With this technology, I love the way that repetition created music. Even when that repetition wasn't necessarily melodic or harmonic, repetition tuned me in to the music of trains and the music of refrigerators of construction and of crying babies. What was once noise seemed part of some larger, longer song. I wondered how I could transfer this logic into poetry, and I landed on the sonnet form. The word sonnet comes from the Italian sonetto, meaning literally little song, which in turn comes from the Latin sonus, meaning sound. As a form both ancient and modern, we see sonnets everywhere today. I'm not unique in my interest in them. Um, I started to hear the sonnet as a part of this long song being sung by poets across history. I wanted to add my voice. But I also doubled down because I also heard tell of a crown of sonnets, which is a series of 14 sonnets, where the last line in the first sonnet is the first line in the second sonnet, and so on, until you get to the 14th sonnet, where the last line of that sonnet is the first line of the first sonnet. Closes the loop, and I had found my sonic logic. So I'm going to read from this crown of sonnets um, right now. <laughs> it opens my book. It's the first part of my book, Listening in Many Publics. Because it's being uh, printed today and only pre-orders are available, however, I have a special offer just for you in the room tonight. If you pre-order the book, you'll get a free download code for the album of ambient music I composed while writing these poems. Uh, you go to Bandcamp, you can download it. This is me doing my best to sell you my book. <laughs> this is, I'm trying. It's also for paragraph. Yes, yes, thank you. From paragraph, right over there. Okay, without any more, I won't read the whole thing because you need to have something left to get into in the book. I'll read for about 10 minutes. Um, it's called Sonnets from Decivilization. I came outside to see the light on wet ground changed. How do I explain to you that I will die? 
Cinnamon on the air. I'm inside your room, which is a rose. No one's here. I fall apart on your sofa in the early afternoon. Spring and death, spring and death. The combined effect of stress and precarious employment. The pitched down color of the sky. A cardboard box peeling in the rain. I reach dramatically for your hand in Target. An unspecific and crowded citizen. You speak to me like a seventh chord. I turn and stare into the resonance. I turn and stare into the resonance of a glacial stone deposited human ages ago at the edge of a desiccated meadow. And in a flash, you decide to trust no one. You're like a lonesome cowboy at the start of the movie. I can hardly remember sitting in half dark and projecting a more exciting life for myself than this, alone in a sea of futures, as if I won't be the same cowboy tomorrow. It has become a challenge lately to get up and slip into the stream without accelerating to flood water overtaking cars, the present far outpaced by our timeless personal consequence. Often the distance between us grows as wide as it really is. The distance between us grows as wide as it really is when I lie in bed and talk with my friend. We have our theories and do our best to articulate them. Though it's hard to say what we mean, we discuss an imminence, but our condition keeps changing. I sense my inability to be totally 100% accurate in his own hesitation or drifting to a seemingly unrelated topic, dinner tomorrow. Though of course, this is central to the question of living well or otherwise, my friend is planning an American tour. That's all he's ever wanted to do. Tour America and make no money. <laughs> I'm awake in some kind of twilight of knowing one thing for sure. In some kind of twilight of knowing one thing for sure, I walk into Circle K with my one life running. Recall the latest research shows atmospheric carbon reduces cognitive ability when the koala bear care station in the stall takes us back to desire for McDonald's. And what, in the cultural logic of late capitalism, did Jameson say about consumers' appetite for a world transformed into sheer images of itself? On somewhere's future condition, I sink to my knees the most certain, with absolute certainty. And nothing I order online ever lands on my doorstep, ready to change me like that. Ready to change me, like that aphoristic sticker on my student's laptop I read while explaining how my face cracked open when I crashed my bike after therapy. So please forgive any confusion in today's lecture on Césaire and what he calls de-civilization, whereby the colonial force degrades itself through violence. Today, the sun shines brightly on our catastrophe. A boy punches his friend to say hello. The variegated future melts away. Outside, the early park glows for workers and Tai Chi practitioners in barren Angrignon lot. They seem to heal me by healing themselves. The only way out is through. The only way out is through the way you came in, the enterprise rep said. You explain to me a type of orange car paint that is also many other colors. Consider this my final poem. For some great meaning only stalls long enough to be looked at when an imagined barrier 
is maintained. Have you heard the parable of the mystic who preferred the sound of the orchestra tuning over Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? I guess he had to sit through the whole thing. I guess she had to sit through the whole thing, forever waking up into the soft fact of self, sublate the need for actualization into a new way of wearing old clothes, the color red rising slightly above the other colors. A military plane passes overhead. It's not the fault of the weather, you explain to the dead sparrow, that poetry is a concave space in the words. And the lovelier paramour of our method photographs the same while occupying the very frame as if they were on a loop. As if they were on a loop, the days sink in and out of phase. Our iambic advance through thresholds of gain. These lines are crucibles of joy forged in the abjection of human will. A language upon which the future is hinged. Somehow you make it to march again. Why can't I find a place to live for a couple years? It's so embarrassing to be alive. I wake up in a strange place but recognize the trees like seeing a word spelled correctly in a mirror. Funny, I have that feeling again of a funnel above my head, the world pouring in. The world pours in. I don't want to live. I want to live in a state of constant ecstasy. Yes, yes, I do. I am afraid of being hurt, and I love to know intimate details about different cities. I have my whole life in my head. Can't you see it? I remember learning to read and being confused by sections in the newspaper, sports, entertainment, politics, arts. Aren't they all the same thing? Music. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. I love the crown of sonnets. Um, well, thank you all uh, for sticking around. We got one more reader. Uh, Unya Kempudu's novel, Naniki, uh, again, when, when, we, when this came across our desk, we knew uh, it was kind of a no-brainer uh, to cover it. Uh, it seemed uh, so interesting, so original. Uh, Unya Kempudu is the author of three novels and is critically acclaimed on both sides of the Atlantic creative practitioner with an interest in cross-disciplinary dialogue. She's a citizen of England, Guyana, and Grenada, and currently lives right here in Montreal. We're lucky to have her, and we're lucky to have her here tonight. Come on up, Unya. Welcome. Thank you all for being here and to the Montreal Review of Books for this uh, invitation and an amazing spread in full color. Oh my God, <laughs> thank you. And to Paragraph Books for hosting my book launch um, and to the Blue Met Festival, which was my invitation to Montreal in 2015, uh, my first visit where I met my other and then started coming back and now I'm here. So here for other reasons too, um, one of which is um, exploring the multimedia arts, which is very prolific in Montreal. So I ended up producing this story as an immersive production and presented that at Concordia last year, which was quite an experience. Um, uh, the picture on the cover is actually a marine biologist, Angelique Braffick, who um, flew into Montreal in January and we did an underwater shoot in, in uh, Piscine Saint-Roch, 
to get this underwater footage to introduce you to the characters. So uh, it was a lot of fun, <laughs> very challenging but fun. So the word uh, naniki, um, which means animating soul being or active spirit in the Taino language, which is uh, indigenous people, it comes from the indigenous people of the Caribbean who were known as Arawaks. You may have heard of the Arawaks in Caribs. Um, and with the help and counseling of Sabauco Koromo Miguel Sagwe Jr., this project's Taino elder and cultural consultant. Um, in this story, I've used the Taino language and indigenous Caribbean culture as almost a fictional language, the names of the islands, their meanings, and so on, as a reminder of the first people of the region who live on in us and with us. And you'll find a glossary at the end of the book of Taino words and some African words also. Uh, Naniki, I use the word here to describe the two main characters, the shift-shaping characters. They're animal guides or next of kin in another species. Uh, so set in 2050 in the Caribbean, Amana, the main character, is of Taino ancestry, and she's a Niara, a water being. Skelele, her teen friend, is of African ancestry, a Turiara, or air being, and he shapeshifts into Amana's world. And the, I connected Skelele to the sky people or the people who could fly, which comes from stories from the southern US and the Caribbean of Africans who could fly back to Africa. But so this is not so much of a hero's or a co-hero's journey and the characters themselves, but it's more of an exploration. It's a journey through the island chain of the Caribbean. And you know how they stretch from South America all the way up to North America. Um, full of so much complexity, diverse ecosystems, histories and stories, lots of stories. And we go in this one forward in time to th the year 3000, to Balbanch Bulbanchia, which is New Orleans, and back through histories and legends to the mainland of Guyana, um, and to what I call before time, but I actually mean 12,000 BCE which is the age of the oldest rem human remains found in South, Af South America, um, which actually defies the theory of the population of the Americas coming through the Bering Strait. And the reference that I pull that from is in the bibliography too. Um, so, there's a lot of story upon story in this, and what makes us, ma makes up the Caribbean as a whole, and makes uh, the interesting mix of creolization. And if I were to really try to encapsulate it, it would be a really fat, big, long book. But you see, it's a really small <laughs> format. <laughs> it's very tight. <laughs> and it's, um, it's a swim. It's a swim um, with the urgency of climate change behind it, fueling us to find a way forward to find purpose. So this piece I'm gonna read from is after Amana meets Skelele underwater. And of course she's fascinated with his transformational self. He's transformed from a water, air being to a water being. They're flirting, they're playing when Amana's elders approach. And we're in the Caribbean Sea in 2050, bear with me, and we're going uh, from the Lightning Bank Reef, and they're being taken, Aman and Skilele, being taken to rest before training the next day. And they're taken to the Niara Nest, which is the Great Blue Hole. It's an underwater sinkhole off the barrier coast of Belize. So we'll go with them. As we move away from Lightning Bank, the strongest and fastest guardians and their barracudas guide Skelele into the deeper blue for training. His flying fish is busy keeping up. My parrotfish keeps looking back as I follow my mother and trainers along the reef. We flow over unending pipes, blue harmonies stroking through us and with us. Flashes of brilliance may be fish, but are also a silver sun stoking this blue, daggering, dazzling its silky depths. 
our soothing movement forward through this warm Caribbean sea, over ghosts of gorgonians, elk horn, and brain corals, is a sometimes blurry but seamless journey. The flex and strength of fins, a scale curve, slipping glimpses of iridescence, sliding with currents that match trade winds above. Now on the surface, there'd be ripples, chippy and sharp streaking the way ahead. On the surface, a starry dapple sheet, always billowing, swaying. A hum, wider than the sea, carries us forward. Echoing with the crackle of shrimp and seabeds, it is a part of the light. It is part of the light and liquid roll. Unlimited, soundless to us, it is a stretch of sight and sensing, vast as this blue. And as we glide with our manta rays, our shadows trigger the light lines. They flicker dimly, flashing ropes of pain and hope. The light of our ancestral migration patterns still senses our presence and guides us. This was the path of the Black Caribs from Hyuruna to Honduras. For us, a straight line towards the great blue hole, always in silence. It is the longest day this time, and even though my friend and her clownfish try to make me laugh, I can't help but see Skelele's colors and movement in everything, and long to see him again. He's out there in this blueness, sweeping forward also, I know. Approaching the barrier reef as we smudge in from the deep blue edge, the brightness defies the end of day. Skylight and waterlight are one, holding us magically. Turquoise glow shines white, whiter, and black wingtips starker. In this shallow sea light run, twilight blends blue-green. Fields of finger coral and seagrass floors beckon small fry as we pass, mimicking, mirroring the snaky surface. Sand grains swirl lazy below, and even though the reefs are almost dead, my cherub fish eyes still see beauty. The blue tangs, too. The pinkish gray lumps are soft and still hold friends and food. Forests of sea fans, sea fan shadows are flickers now of light that show sand ripples, streaks on the soft lumps. But if you tuck under a ledge, though, you can still hear the murmur of polyps. And shooting across the shallows, none can tell flashes of light from fish, from glamour water's snaky blinding dance. Shimmering with a thousand tiny sprats scattering and changing directions, we still see beauty and live it. Yan Yan Katu, we are almost home. Gentle, gentle, cradle me. In between swells, take me in slowly, carrying my spines of birds, my casuarina needles, shells of coconut and turtle, glass and bone. Shards of our lifetimes in your open, open-ended mouth, your roaming hunger, feed us, feed on us, until land, until every grain of land is sea. Knee, be, knee be. See us now, tell me what, tell me how. Light us with a language we don't know. Ha home. Sinking, sinking deeper down, the walls of our nest hold caves of secrets, slightly murky or embedded in the rocks itself. We sink down, down, leaving our naniki where they choose to sleep, protected by the nurse sharks. Deeper to rest on our ledges and sand bed in blackness, hardness. This is where the babies sleep and where all nurturing comes from. This is where a piece of cake fell into our world and mixed Earth people's knowledge with ours. It is our vault that the elders keep full of love. Of course, sleep comes quickly, even as the babies snuffle and the elders snort. Nestled in with my closest siblings, my saline, 
sleep, nestled in with my closest siblings, sleep is hardness. But before it wraps me, my saline mind shows me skillily, tucked in with some adolescents on a ledge, already in dream time. So they share a dream that night, the same dream of this futuristic island, that strange landscape that they decide is a sign that they need to go and explore and see what they, the future is. And they shore up in Boriken, which is Puerto Rico. Um, and there, as they enter this sort of virtual back battlefield, uh, Taino elder tells them, Okama, listen. And they leave listening to the sound of a mayokan, a Taino wooden drum. And they're back in the sea, and as they pass Haiti in the sea, the, the sound of the drum turns to a, a talking drum. And as they approach Cuba, the sound becomes the clave. So we're at Cuba, which means where fertile land is abundant in 2100. The two bar rhythm speeds up into a synthetic frenzy and we torpedo on, whizzing past mountain lumps, parched between protective domes. Skirting past islands of Varadero, swinging down, we tuck into a harbor under the dome of Havana. Surface calm, a rebreather, breathe, Okama. A massive construction ship fills the docks, but behind it, dome scrapers rise and loud air smells burnt. We can't tell machines from people or robots, busy unloading, building as if fueled by the plastic music. Skelele signals, and we put our head against the sea surface. The frantic music is slowing, gradually, reverting to clave, and then drums. As we listen to the rhythms reversing, the dome begins to peel back, and time peels back. And as it peels, people begin looking more like Kiara, Earth people. And the massive ship fades away, and the city is changing too, smaller buildings and dirt streets. We look up into a clear, melodious sky. The singing blackbird, Skelele whispers, but we see nothing. The port fills with ships, with sail ships and Spaniards, and some Taino, but the singing blackbird is heralding. With his lute, Ziriab is plucking fear, warning of the arrival of a terrible ship. We watch it, approaching the harbor, slowly, and on its prow, Zarabanda, god of war and iron. He bristles with his machete held high. Now we can see the ghost of Ziryab in the sky, swathed in his robes and turban, woeful. The singer is keeper of records. Zarabanda hovers angrily, sparking as enslaved Africans are brought ashore, ashore by Spaniards. Music is memory. Dancing is an intense state of listening. Zariab sing, Ziryab sings before disappearing into a cloud. Time has stopped and started moving forward again. It is the low growl that we hear, a background hum. On a wide promenade, some Africans are drumming and others start dancing, the Insala Banda, weaving and knotting themselves, singing a story song. They are making a Bantu prenda, a charm, for Zarabanda, Skelele says. Stamping, swirling, riling, they, let, they dance to let the soul rip, tearing away all that holds them captive, and we see the dance become the mambo. As Zarabanda stays suspended above the dancing singers, a giant calabash is brought forward by the surrounding crowd, and we float closer. From the inside of the calabash, the tinkling sound of a kalimba is getting louder. The calabash opens up slowly, and the thumb piano is playing itself, playing its flattened metal nails for Zarabanda and growing. Its sound is growing too, and, and the people, all of them are dancing as the calabash shrinks and the kalimba morphs into a piano, playing its own keys into Latin dance music. 
and the Spaniards are playing a lute and something like a flute. Brass is shining and blaring and time won't stay still again. Pardos, free, free blacks and morenos sing in punto, a different rhythm, decima form. The dancing turns up from, contra, from, from contradanza to danzon, and a reme dancer takes the center, cowbells around his waist. A buka, skillily slips. Rumba dancers and players on trumpets, trombones and saxophones, redoblante side drums and bombo bass drums, quinto and the lowest pitch Congo drum, tambadora, tumble in. Metal bells, spoons hit in pans, iron rims ringing, and congas rise again. La clave and maracas, piano, full drum kit, bamboo guagua, and the dancers are packed together and whirring, son, mambo, salsa, songo, timba music swirls them faster, richer. And who is this? Chano Ponzo and Dizzy Gillespie leading an African Afro-Cuban jazz orchestra. Manteca! All suited up right there. Again, the time spin changes, the pirate style swagger kerchiefs and bling, negros curros into black American rappers, Punto Guajira poetry slides into rap. All of a sudden, Around us, the water is flowing silver and gold, thickening, tugging us out of the port and up. Underwater, we can't see very far, and the music has faded into the chink and clink of jewelry, gold and silver headpieces, necklaces and bracelets, tumbling with emeralds and colored stones of Central America in the stealing flow of the Gulf Stream from south to north. There is no time in water, not in my seas. When animals created land and we were gods and everything was one, there was and is no time. To feel the passage of all that has gone in water as it passes through me is to be. Daka. If I can bear to be this sea, there's nothing to be afraid of, even without an aniki. Skelele sees me, and with this heavy pull twisting us, he has wrapped his thin hand around mine. I'm not resisting. We will go where we are to be. And in all my salt years, I have paid my dues for my life, my ancestors, Naniki, Kiara, with every grain of salt and water. This is our way, a way of being ever present, past and future. We will go on, even though we could escape this flow and head back. Yan Yan Katu. I can see beyond time, so what is the fear? Hurry, they say. If not, we won't be at all. Become protective faster. So we can slow the synthetic race, the pace, racing against ourselves and each other. Skelele too? If I can be in his sky as he is with my sea, then flow me onward, forward. Thank you. Unya, thank you so much. And won't you please stick around? And could I invite up uh, Jay and Louisa as well? We'll take a few questions. Um, just to talk about uh, your work. So have a seat if you like. Sit or stand as you wish. Um, so I guess, Unia, my first question will be for you. Um, your book, uh, I mean, congratulations on your book. It's so, uh, it's so imaginative and so epic, uh, reaching into the distant past all the way into the far future. Um, so my question is, how did you compress it into such a small volume? <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, is this, is this Hello? mic on? Hello? No. Oh, let's, get, let's get one of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, that's a good question, and I think that's why I ended up writing it half in poetry and half in prose. Um, be, which, is not, uh, which is relatively new for me. I would not call myself a poet. <laughs> Sitting next to a serious poet here. But it was, um, 
it was a challenge and but a joy because the, for me coming back to the joy and the freedom of writing on the page and um, following the guidance of the rhythm of the words and the flow of the journey, um, it ended up being this very quick sort of um, uh, sliding through language and place and time that compressed everything. So um, I did try to make it longer, but <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> I mean, you know, often when, when, when you read, uh, I mean, it's good to leave them wanting more, I guess. <laughs> Uh, you, you, yeah, um, so uh, uh, related somewhat to that, I mean, you talked earlier and you spoke also in the, the MRB article about how it was initially a multimedia piece and you didn't conceive of it as being, uh, as being a novel. So how did that come to be? Did you have more, more to tell when the multimedia piece was complete? Well, it was really because the story... Um, for me felt like something that was less literary or uh, in the sort of written form and something that could be interacted with. So it was an experiment of sorts to see and explore and I learned a huge amount um, how to bring different types of media together. And so it was an exploration or experiment in how could I bring you into the story world um, so it was a surround, uh, sort of 360 projection uh, in a room, a circular room, uh, with the underwater footage and um, images and video all around you, with live performance um, by a narrator, a Piero, and a circus and traditional carnival act or performance. So it was really to try to bring you into the story world and introduce you to the characters in a fantastical, immersive way, which um, took a lot out of me. I'm sure. And everybody involved. <laughs> it was a really good experience. <laughs> Great. Um, well, I, uh, I wanted to, we, we can talk more, and please feel free to put up your hand if you have a question, but I'll ask a few questions. Uh, we've got one right now. I, I just I'll just repeat the question for anyone who didn't hear it or for anyone uh, watching at home, if I if I may <laughs> paraphrase it, um, that there's a shared theme of transformation uh, throughout the uh, throughout the books and it's observe transformation, live observe transformation, live transformation. Right, so how is transformation important uh, in your work? Why don't you start, Louisa? Um, well, yes, um, it, it's making me, it makes me think, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to write this was because we're facing climate change and it's, it's, um, it's hard not to despair in the face of climate change. And I wanted my book to be a kind of antidote to despair. Um, that, that would let you kind of go back and see how other people have looked at nature and how our, how our view of nature has, has been transformed over, the, over the, the last two or three centuries and continues to be transformed. Um, I mean, I, I think that's a bit existential for me. I'm, I'm a bit more, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm a, I, I don't think of my writing as, as, as sort of about transformation exactly, but um, but I would say that um, what I, I find very exciting about, you know, I, I was just excited by the, 
the, the, how, how people responded to, to difference when they saw something that was so different and what could it mean, you know, and, and I'm also very encouraged by um, the way natural history has, has transformed over the, over the years and now is so much in the hands of us. You know, there's, there's things like eBird and iNaturalist and, um, you know, which enable us all to participate in this um, exploration of the natural world. And I think, for me, that's extremely hopeful in terms of climate change too, because, um, and, and it's kind of come full circle in a way, because those, those people who, um, those people who came to Canada in the early 1800s or 1700s, um, they they were they didn't you know they didn't know scientifically very much about what they were looking at they they just looked at it and they found different ways of, of 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 depicting it and tried to make sense of it and make sense of 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 the meaning of life in a way you know the whole sort of story of evolution like why why did this all happen and um and, but they were amateurs they really did they didn't they weren't experts and i think um that kind of understanding of of, like, um, you know, trying to understand the natural world, it, it, it shouldn't be, it, it shouldn't be um, the preserve of experts. And it's kind of come full circle now because it's, it, it's not anymore. And we all need to be involved and all of us in, and, um, you know, just the, the influence of, of indigenous people in helping us to understand nature, natural history in a, in a different way, like, you know, an Inuit sculpture, which is, which is from, comes from the, the, a, a really beautiful Inuit sculpture, which clearly comes from somebody who spent hours and hours and hours sitting on the ice looking at animals and observing them. Um, I, I don't think I'm answering your question at all, but I'm just <laughs> rabbiting on. <laughs> I got one. I love this question. For me, this is the question of literature the question of writing, uh, full stop. So I think for me, what I love about poetry is that something it can do is, as you're writing it and as you're reading it, um, it makes the world strange again, or it defamiliarizes it in a certain way. And when I do this, or when I read it, and hopefully when, or I, I imagine when other people do this too, you start to see that this is just one way. This is a very specific way of doing, being alive. And we're not doing a very good job I think, <laughs> a lot of the time. And so this idea of transformation is really the through line through the whole book. Um, it's, it's a way of trying to imagine another world, imagine another way of being together in this space, um, changing the way that we work and love and everything. So um, I try to both represent it, you know, let's say if you're reading it and there's some content there that you receive, but also in the way it kind of behaves as a book. Um, to try to enact this sort of transformation um, that is so necessary, so, yeah. And uh, I appreciate what, you, what you're saying, both of you are too, because the, the, for me, poetry transforms the way that we uh, access uh, a subject or um, material, and your sort of documentation of change and transformation and the way in which documentation evolves as well um, is interesting. I, for me, I think the, the, that climate change is transformation. It's the biggest sort of changes that we're seeing in this, is it the Anthropocene now or not? But um, how do we learn to transform ourselves as humans to deal with the consequence, consequences that we're causing? Um, but also to connect with um, aspects of our surroundings that we tend to not deal with or even see. So that's why for me the, the theme of transformation and is to get to interconnection. Um, that if we can evolve a little bit of seeing ourselves as interconnected, um, we are part of the transformation that is always ongoing. Thank you, Unya. I wanted to pick up on something you just said and just tie it in with some things that you talked about earlier, Louisa. Um, you talked about the importance uh, of acknowledging uh, 
and incorporating uh, indigenous knowledge. And uh, you spoke earlier about your work being an antidote to despair. Um, and uh, um, you know, Alexander Hackett talked about this a little bit in his review, but in your book you talk about um, the uh, about a collaborative aspect to the way that um, indigenous people and the settler colonial people uh, worked on uh, on natural history and science. And I wondered, is that something that came that you came uh, an idea that you came across or that came through in your research? Well, n n if not as such, but you know, when you start reading the diaries of William Logan, who was the one who trudged across Canada, you know, making that map, um, you know, you you realize you come across a page in his notebook where he's talking about the indigenous guides and how he's going to pay them. He's going to give them a, a pair of moccasins each and three dollars or something, and then um, and then he, he talks about um, John John. Um, Macro, I think it was, who was a, a Mi'kmaq um, guide who, who was completely indispensable to him. Like those, um, those guys wouldn't have got anywhere at all without the indigenous people, um, not just not just helping them survive, teaching them, teaching them how to survive, but 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 telling them about stuff. You know, the, they had. Um, I mean, I don't know how the language thing worked, but, but some of them, you know, some of these, ex these um, explorers who went up to the far north, for example, learnt, learnt Inuit, and, and they learnt a tremendous amount. And that, I think that, that's a side of, of the sort of history of natural history that hasn't been looked at, but um, well enough. But you can see by the, the, the natural history that is, is being done now that it... it, it has been co-constructed um, between these. I, I think of them as three groups because there was the colonists, the people who came from, and many went back, like the French um, um, in New France and then the, the British, from, and they, they kind of did their thing and then they went, went home again, but then there were the settlers and then there were the indigenous people, and together um, they, they, they brought different things to the table and they brought different kinds of knowledge, and I, I'm completely convinced that it, it's, it's made a difference to the way we do science today, even if now it's more explicit, like, you know, people are uh, looking at indigenous science and indigenous natural history in a more kind of direct way, but I think it's been there all along. Right. Um, does anyone have more questions? Um, we're happy to take, uh, take more questions from, uh, from any of you. Um, well, uh, Jay, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, I, I, I love the title of your book, Listening in Many Publics. Uh, can, you, can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. I'll be completely honest because um, I don't have another answer. <laughs> I, was, I struggled for a long time with the title. Um, I had many different titles. Um, and I basically asked my editor, I was like, can you please find a title for me? <laughs> can you do this? And he, it's, it's a line of poetry in one of, it's pretty much smack dab in the middle of the book um, during this, um, a long poem that plays with syntax and fragmentation. Um, and there's a line, listening in many publics. And he pointed to that and I thought, okay, this makes a lot of sense to me. This is actually a very clear through line through the sonnets, as songs, through the final section, uh, which is called the image world, which is kind of like um, this underworld journey um, where it's the realm of images um, that are kind of this, it's kind of like an evil vibe. <laughs> so this, this idea of, of, of listening uh, and in a public, public kind of arena, um, just it felt really right. So I was very grateful to the editor at that moment. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of the things we do. Um, so um, I wanted to open up the floor again to see if there were any other... Uh, any any more questions coming from our, our audience? Well, I have one for Lisa. And uh, I was in Montreal right now in an exhibit of Henry Moore. And I know you're heading into culture, sculpture and was very much into uh, nature. And you talked about driftwood and everything. And I was wondering if at all it was uh, an influence or, or if you appreciated it as art. So the question is, was the work of Henry Moore influential on your, uh, on your work at all? Or inspirational. Or inspirational. Well, I, 
it's probably in some unconscious way because I've, I've always loved Henry Moore and I, growing up in England, I went to see a lot of his sculptures and his drawings. I have books of his drawings and I'm sure it did have an impact on me. Um, it was not maybe a conscious impact, but um, yeah, and I, as I wanted to really get across in the book how close art and like how close art and nature are and how important it is to, to um, you know, to, to not, not to separate them. Um, so, yeah, no, I love Henry Moreau. Yes, totally. Yes, I was completely influenced by him. How did you know? <laughs> um, I'll give one more opportunity if anyone wants to, uh, to ask a question. Um, well, Unia, Jay, Louisa, thank you so much for coming and for sharing your work with us. And thank you all so much for, uh, for coming to our lunch. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. You can, uh, you can purchase, you can purchase Nainiki, uh, or the, and the calf with two heads. You can pre-order listening in many publics over at the paragraph books uh, table. Um, thank you for coming.